Professor, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, everybody, that uh, is with us today. We have uh, another, another webinar in our series discussing uh, private law and technology. And today we, we receive Professor Jay Kizen, that uh, is a professor in Illinois, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the College of Law and uh, is an expert in the subject. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, I think you can start now. Um, um, good morning, good everyone. Morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Professor, Professor Rafael Drash, Drash for, uh, for uh, inviting me. me. I'm pleased I'm to be talking talk about this, about this, about this topic. This topic. Um, uh, I'll first I'll begin. First begin by looking, by looking at data, at data from, a from a privacy, privacy perspective, perspective. And, then and then look at look it at from, it from security, security perspective. perspective. Okay, perfect. So, so as you know, there is the general data protection regulation in the EU, and you may have studied it, and maybe you have some other speakers who are talking about this issue. Uh, as you know, the GDPR you know, protects the processing of personal data. And I put personal data in quotes because that is what the GDPR calls it. Uh, in the US, we usually call it personally identifiable information, PII. Now, the GDPR, of course, is a European law. However, if you have a website in the US, and if there are companies and entities that then present these websites to EU citizens, then of course they must comply with the GDPR. So in, from that perspective, a lot of American companies and businesses have to comply with the GDPR even though there is no U.S. data protection law. Now, the U.S. companies employ one provision in the GDPR that says that, yes, you can process the personal data of data subjects, that's the language from the GDPR, as long as you obtain clear and unambiguous consent. So this consent is a legal ground that allows you to process the data of your customers and your, uh, the people visiting your site. Uh, the GDPR also requires that these people be able to revoke consent. And it also requires that you seek to renew consent regularly. Of course, there are some other legal basis for processing data as well, in, due to a contract or, or trying to protect the vital interests of data subjects, so on and so forth. But basically, you need one of those legal basis to you know, process personal data. And that is still true for many U.S. companies doing business all over the world. Having said that, before we look at how U.S. companies comply with the GDPR, let me step back and tell you a little bit about data protection in the U.S. There is no federal law that governs personally identifiable information in the US. It is a political matter. There's a lot of lobbying on all sides. Uh, several hundreds of millions of dollars are spent by companies like Google and Facebook, et cetera. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it remains to be seen uh, if there will be a federal law and what form it might take. Having said that, there are a number of states that have already begun legislating 
at the state level. So uh, just to give you a couple of examples, we have the California Consumer Privacy Act, and there is the Nevada Privacy Law, which is really a, an addition to a previously existing law that governed um, you know, online transactions. Uh, and it has provisions that are sort of, you know, quote unquote, GDPR like, uh, but they are different. Uh, it does allow, for example, California citizens have a right to opt out of sales of their data. It gives them the right to see what data has been collected and they can request that certain data about them be deleted. So the CCPA is effectively the most prominent data protection law that we have in the US from the privacy side. Uh, there's a, the Nevada privacy law also gives Nevada residents the right to opt out. Now, in addition, <clears throat> if you're a U.S. company and you want to make sure that you can qualify as a country that is compliant with the GDPR, since the U.S. broadly speaking is not, this Privacy Shield program has been developed by the U.S. Department of Commerce, actually the International Trade Administration in the Department of Commerce. So there are these two Privacy Shield frameworks. Uh, one is the U.S.-EU framework and the other is the Swiss-U.S. framework. And they provide companies with a mechanism to comply with the data protection requirements, and that then allows you to process data transfers between the EU and the US. So in other words, the US Privacy Shield is a way to ensure compliance with the GDPR in the US. So in the absence of a federal law, this is kind of where we are. Uh, I'm hearing some, uh, another conversation is, are you able to hear me or no? Are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes, 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 yes. 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 Okay, 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 thank you. Um, so this doesn't mean in the US that there is no data protection laws. From the privacy perspective, you know, we really have only this state laws. But from a security perspective, now if you're an entity that has data, then you must protect that data. And so from a security perspective, there's a lot of laws. So these laws allow companies to protect data of their consumers. <clears throat> you can imagine that as a company, you want to make sure that the data you have, you have some legal basis to protect the data. And so these are some of the laws and regulations that are in place. Let me begin by talking a little bit about tort liability for data related injuries. If you are a consumer and your data has been compromised, the key question is, imagine that there is some e-commerce company, you know, Target, which was the subject of a big data breach, and your personal information has been compromised, can you sue Target? That's really the question. Can you sue them 
because you have suffered an injury because they did not protect your data carefully. Now that question, the law on this, as decided by the courts, is slowly changing. You're seeing one or two decisions that seem to allow people to sue a company if they don't protect the data carefully. Um, I have an article on this uh, called Liability for Data Injuries uh, that you're welcome to look at um, on the Social Science Research Network. But the point here is this. Is there a legal duty to protect data, to secure data? What I suggest in my work is that very often companies underestimate the amount of cyber risk that they face. And they very often think it's not going to happen to me or so on and so forth. There's a whole bunch of cognitive biases that result in a systematic underestimation of this risk. And so what I suggest is that there should actually be a legal duty so that parties are encouraged to engage in a process of managing and reducing their cyber risk. Now, the problem is that courts have a lot of difficulty with recognizing that data insecurity is a injury for which we need tort liability. Of course, it's a privacy injury. And of course, it affects our lives. And of course, it affects our ability to take decisions with respect to our lives and creates a lot of anxiety because we have to go and pay money for credit monitoring. We have to go cancel credit cards, do all these things. But courts have been unwilling to find data security to be something that is the basis for a tort claim. Now that is changing. The Seventh Circuit uh, a year or so ago had a decision that, that said that in fact, there is money being spent by people whose data has been compromised and so they are entitled to compensation. In addition to this tort liability, the biggest statute that really protects data in the US is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this prevents outsiders and insiders from accessing your data. So this is actually an old law and has been around really for 35 years, and it has been rewritten several times. The main statute is 18 U.S.C. Section 1030, and it defines protected computer very broadly. In fact, I've got the definition here, and if you look at Section B, it basically says it includes any computer that affects interstate commerce. So in fact, any computer that is online is considered a protected computer. And so what the CFAA does is it provides both civil and criminal penalties for a whole variety of actions taken by people and I've just provided a list of various kinds of unauthorized access to computers, data, et cetera, and causing damage, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the CFAA violations <clears throat> are misdemeanors. However, there are some longer sentences, provided there are certain aggravating factors. Now, this is on the criminal side. I'll get to the civil side in a minute. 
The nevertheless, the CFA is controversial. It's controversial because it basically says you must be unauthorized or you must exceed whatever authorization you have. Those are the two big categories for falling within the CFAA. Now, the problem here is, what do you mean by exceeding authorization? Many of these websites have all kinds of terms of use. Is violating a term of use exceeding authorized access? Facebook says you must use your real name. What if you use some other name. Is that a violation of CFA? These are the kinds of issues that are coming up. Now, generally, the statute says without authorization, the sense is that that is about people who are trying to hack in or people who are trying to sort of, who really are outside the company. But then exceeding authorization is seen as something that somebody inside the company does. So, for example, you're working in the finance department in a company. Why are you trying to access the HR computers? Why are you trying to access human resources information? Uh, you know, maybe you're not allowed to do that. And that would then put you in a situation where you're exceeding authorization. And in many civil cases, courts have said that you owe a duty of loyalty to the company. And you might you know, be acting without authorization if you breach that duty of loyalty. Now, some other courts have said that in order to exceed the scope of authorization, the computer owner or the company must explicitly revoke your authorization. They must tell you, OK, you you cannot you had this access, but you don't have it anymore. Maybe you're fired. Maybe you're demoted. You know, the others who say that you have a duty of loyalty, even if. The owner does not know that you've breached that duty of loyalty, so it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, as an employee, you have a duty of loyalty and you have to stay within the scope of your employment authorization. So there is some discussion about these things. Um, the issue of exceeding the scope or violating terms of service is a, is a huge issue. It's a huge issue and there's a lot of litigation. Uh, one of the most celebrated cases involved uh, you know, the Drew case uh, where somebody tried to impersonate uh, somebody else and that then resulted in this uh, teenager committing suicide. And so it, it really was a very uh, sad um, and a really difficult case. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it was hard to say that this was a CFA violation and the courts, uh, you know, um, um, agreed that it was not a CFA violation. <clears throat> There are other issues like what is the what counts as damage and what counts as loss under the CFAA. So, you know, if you download some files and you copy some company secrets, is the downloading, is that part of the damage? If you then try to erase some files so nobody can find out, is that also considered damage? What if you shut down some computers and shut down some network in the process? Is that part of the violation? What if the company loses some profits because of what you've done? Then is that also part of the damage and loss? So there's a lot of issues about what is foreseeable and what is consequential um, in the CFAA. So I just wanted to give you a sense of the kind of disputes that exist in this area. <clears throat> Finally, you do have civil actions under the CFAA, but imagine why they don't really provide a lot of help. Why? Because, you know, if, 
you, your data is compromised. You know, if you can go after some penniless 16 year old who hacked into some computer, that doesn't do you any good because, because you know, this, uh, you, what, what are you going to gain by bringing a civil lawsuit against the teenager? Uh, what you really want is to sue Target or somebody else, you know, not the hacker, you know. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, it, it does allow you to proceed against somebody who violates the CFAA. Uh, but it, the important thing here is that people who design and manufacture software, hardware, the companies, uh, they cannot be sued for negligent design. So they cannot be sued for having you know, all sorts of vulnerabilities, all sorts of software and hardware vulnerabilities, um, and, and there, there can be no negligence claim made against them. I want to tell you a, a little bit about some of the international aspects since we're really um, we're talking across countries here. But uh, this is an interesting case where you might remember uh, Ross Albright. Uh, he was the guy who founded the Silk Road. This is the dark net a website that was um, trafficking in um, narcotics and money laundering and so on. The FBI agent who ultimately realized that this Silk Road server is located in Iceland, um, he essentially used a sort of a hack back type approach to try to get information about this server. Now, the question really becomes, can you do this kind of hack back or can law enforcement hack into some suspect computers without a warrant, especially when they're located outside the U.S.? So what, is, what does the CFAA say about that? So this is kind of an example of that situation. Um, another situation, uh, which is also interesting, uh, involves uh, South America. Uh, is the case of uh, Ubiquity Networks versus Kozumi. They're both U.S. companies, but Kozumi sold computer networking hardware under the Ubiquity name, except that they got it from China and they sold it. It went straight from China to Argentina and never entered the U.S. And so then the question became, in this kind of situation, you know, how do you exercise jurisdiction over you know parties when the US is not involved in this particular case because of the trademark Lanham Act it allowed extraterritorial jurisdiction and that's why they could actually do it but normally the biggest problem with data protection all over the world is that somebody who hacks in to your computers from outside the US, you have very difficult, just almost impossible to get personal jurisdiction over them. Um, and so it's really very difficult to do much. Um, and as a result, it raises the question of, can you engage in active defense? If you're a company in the US, can you hack back? Can you do these kinds of things? And that's, that's a big uh, issue as well. So bottom line is there's a lot of people who are pushing for various kinds of reform of the CFAA really to, pro to make it possible to provide more meaningful protection to data. I want to talk a little bit also about data breach legislation. This is a situation when you're a company and you have a lot of important data about your consumers and let's say it's breached. Today, data breach statutes exist in all 50 states. There is no federal data breach law because companies are concerned that if there is a federal data breach law, then that might actually be quite strict. So currently what we have is a whole bunch of state laws that vary all over the place. There's variations about 
you know, what kind of information qualifies. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. It's also if you're a company and your data is breached, then who do you have to notify? Is it in enough to simply notify the state government? Is it enough to just notify the secretary of state in your particular state? Or do you have to actually notify consumers? And by the way, very few states allow the consumer to sue. So you're not going back to my simple example, under the data breach law, very few states give you a chance to sue, sue Target for because your data was compromised. Now, there's a lot of scholarly commentary and there's a lot of discussion about how the data breach laws must be made more strong, that it must include not just personally identifiable information uh, like social security numbers and so on, but it should also include medical data. It should include biometric data. It should include things like your photos and your image and you know fingerprints and so on and so forth. Now, there are some states that have specific biometric information privacy act, BIPA. Uh, Illinois is one of them. And Illinois actually has the toughest uh, biometric information privacy act in the US. In fact, Facebook recently had to pay a $500 million fine because they were using images and they were tagging images without the consent of uh, you know, citizens of Illinois. There's also other commentary that says that people must be informed. It's not in, enough to just inform the state. People must be informed. There are others who argue that companies must be forced to implement security measures. And perhaps one of the most powerful laws protecting data in the US is laws in states like California that require companies that have your data to destroy your personal information if it is no longer needed. In other words, if you've not done any transaction with them for a long period of time, you know, several months, so on, uh, you know, maybe 18 months have gone by, you've never bought anything from them, you know, then you should destroy uh, data related to you. So, so that's, that's, um, uh, that's, I think, a powerful piece. Finally, I want to mention uh, the, the last piece of law in the U.S. where that is designed to protect your data. Very often, your data information, like your date of birth, your um, home address, your social security number, is very often combined with other documents. And that results in a lot of identity theft in the US. So here is an example of where we do have a federal law that basically says that using false documents to engage in some type of un unlawful activity is a crime. And of course, the, you know, the extent of punishment depends on, you know, what did you steal? What is the value of what you stole, et cetera, et cetera. And there are various scenarios in 18 USC section 1028 that deals with this. But that is, uh, in fact, a set of laws that do exist at the federal level. And this is really a little bit of an exception. So I want to stop here. It's been about 30 minutes since I've been speaking. Uh, and what I wanted to tell you is that this is very much an area where there's a lot of change and there's a lot of activity. Uh, and um, I think it's an exciting area to study and be engaged. And it poses a lot of interesting questions, both from the privacy perspective and from the security perspective. And I'll stop right here. Thank you, Professor Kizan. Uh, and now we can start the discussion. I don't know if uh, anyone here would like to to pose a question. 
<laughs> I have mine, but <laughs> uh, please feel uh, please free. Please feel free. Professor, uh, one first question. What's your opinion about the discussion of uh, a federal uh, statute of uh, data protection in the US? So, so this is, this a, is very a very contentious, contentious issue. issue. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the main problem is there are those who believe that people like Google and Facebook are just not being honest about all the data processing that they're doing. Or you remember all this Cambridge Analytica. You remember that whole uh, situation there. Right? So, so, so there's a lot of people who believe that. Uh, and um, data is, after all, the currency of the 21st century. <laughs> you know, there's so much data that is being collected. But more importantly, more importantly, different pieces of data are being agglomerated. It, the aggregation of the data is really something that allows companies to get a very clear idea of who you are in a very granular way. So it is a problem. It is a problem. But these companies are also spending a lot of money, literally hundreds of millions of dollars. By one report, it was uh, somebody mentioned that they've spent 500 plus million dollars lobbying Congress to sort of not have uh, strict <laughs> <laughs> laws. Of course, that has also caused a backlash, and now there are people in Congress who, who, you know, talk about breaking them up and not allowing, sorry, like, Facebook to own Instagram because uh, that allows them to combine the images with the other browsing habits. So, so there is, there is, you know, there is, it's, you know, these companies are under siege, you know, on various sides. Uh, so it sort of remains to be seen, um, you know, um, what happens. Um, uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, let me point out the, uh, that the French, uh, you know, data protection authorities, uh, you know, they fined Google for the activities with respect to French citizens. They fined them 50 million. So, 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 so there is some rules that. Uh, you know, even if we don't have a federal law, you know, if there is a lot of rules and regulations all over the world, then companies who do business all over the world, they do have to comply. So, so it's it's not really that simple. That hey, you know, they can get away with it. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, you have people, uh, professors, and so on, um, uh, who you know who are arguing about surveillance capitalism. There is now a surveillance capitalism going on where basically, you know, you are constantly being surveilled and this is being monetized. And so, so, you know, I think this is very much changing, but I have to say that consumers are of course agitated and consumers of course don't realize how much information about them is being taken. So there's an informational asymmetry <laughs> because he, every individual doesn't realize how much information is being taken about them, and they cannot properly value that information. So, so, so you know, so you have that issue. But on the other hand, companies they do have to comply, and I mentioned the U.S. Privacy Shield. They do have to comply. So, so it's not like uh, you know there is no legal recourse. So that's a sort of a long answer to. To, to a broad question, but there's a lot going on. And the point too, uh, for these uh, big companies, I don't know if it uh, could be better for them uh, to have the rules of the game. Because nowadays in US, you have this uh, different uh, 
different uh, statutes, uh, different uh, states. This causes a mess in some sense. Right. No? Um, uh, 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 you, you bring up a great point. Uh, your point is a really valuable one, which is that uncertainty and lack of clarity sometimes is worse <laughs> than having a strict law, because at least you know what you need to do. And the GDPR is actually a very good example. You need clear, unambiguous consent. That's what the GDPR says. So, so you know, you can live with that. You can explain what you're doing to collect data, what kind of cookies you're using, so on. The GDPR requires that you present all this information to a consumer and the consumer can then consent. And of course, the consumer can then change their mind, revoke consent, you know, and you have to remind the consumer again and again that the consent has to be renewed. But there is some clear rules. So if you follow them, then, you know, you're okay. So I agree with you. In, in fact, the, uh, the, this, type of uncertainty is okay if you're a large company and you have lots of money to spend <laughs> trying to sort of <laughs> deal with all these differences, you know, and presenting different websites to if you're a EU citizen, all this stuff. It's great, for, but it's not great for small and medium enterprises that will then be forced to simply comply with the most stringent law. So, so yes, I mean, absolutely correct. I mean, you know, if you've got hundreds of billions of dollars like uh, these large tech companies do, uh, you know, then, then they actually benefit from some of the uh, chaos. But, but typically, uh, uh, you know, typically I agree with you that, that, that one of the uh, basic insights in economic analysis of law is that legal uncertainty uh, can create all kinds of additional uh, costs that really are, you know, burdensome. People, questions? I have a question. question. Please. Professor, Professor, Professor Paul, Paul, thanks for the thanks presentation. For the presentation. Uh, my, uh, question my question is, is Today, Today, what are the enforcement measures adopted in the U.S. by the authorities in relation to big tech companies such as Facebook and Google? So, you know, of course, there is a, a couple of different perspectives on this. But the Federal Trade Commission that is in charge of regulating deceptive consumer practices has brought a lot of privacy actions against companies, you know, including Google, et cetera. So they, there are laws that exist where you, they're largely contractual. So you say in your terms of agreement, you're going to do something and then you do something else. You say, I will not share this information with some third party or so on and so forth, but then you go ahead and do it. Then those kinds of violations have always been enforced by the FTC. Now, the argument that is made is not that these actions don't exist. The arguments, the criticisms of them are twofold. One is, they don't do anything except in the really egregious cases. So uh, there's a lot of violations that are not enforced. In other words, the policing is poor. And number two, they say the extent of the fines are not large. You know, basically, it's not like hundreds of millions of dollars are fined. That's not the case. So the benefit that the companies get from your data far exceeds the cost 
<laughs> due to the fines. So the environment is such that you can actually continue to process people's PII. And if you get caught, you still benefit from using people's PII without telling them or without properly obtaining their consent and so on. So that's those are the sort of the criticisms. But uh, I think your question is essentially assuming that that is the case, and you're right. <laughs> Tart must not pay. <laughs> that's one point, I think. Uh, people, more questions do you have? Anyone? I have one. I have one. Who? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, first uh, of first all, of all uh, uh, thank you very much for the explanation, Professor. Uh, my question is if uh, people here, uh, people in the US are more concerned with their personal data because of, uh, of what happened in the last elections with the Cambridge Analytica. And since this year, uh, there will be uh, uh, another election. So my question is if people are more concerned with their personal data. Thank you. Um, you bring up a good point. People are concerned. But unfortunately, if you ask the ordinary person, you know, he says, well, what can I do about it? I'm feeling so helpless <laughs> because, uh, you know, what can I do? I can delete my Facebook account, you know, and many people do that. Uh, you know, I can go and uh, try to minimize, uh, you, you know, have my own domain, don't use Gmail or something like that. So, so, so people try to do these things. Um, and um, people try to sign up for monitoring services to, to make sure that, uh, you know, um, if somebody is doing a credit check or so on, um, you know, so the, they try to sign up for monitoring services. Who, who, who is trying to use your data? Who's trying to use your social security number? So on and so forth. So, so essentially, people do engage in what I call self-help. People are engaging in self-help. Uh, I think it is happening. Uh, however, the trouble is that they are also being coerced. By coerced, I mean now you delete your Facebook account. Now you are disconnected. Now you cannot go look up something, <laughs> you know, on Facebook. <laughs> so now you turn off your cookies. Uh, you 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 cannot read the New York Times. <laughs> you know, so 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 the problem is when they try to help themselves. You know, many times the cost for them to try to enforce their privacy is too high and 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 it just gets very difficult for them you know, it means i cannot read anything i cannot do anything you know so so this is the real problem so so unfortunately yes there are people who are very determined and who are trying to engage in self help and, and they but it's not that easy thank you professor we have another question of Juliana. Hello. Hello. Professor, Professor please, please. Do you, do you think, think that in the coming year, the United States will adopt a federal law, not a protection of federal law? Thank you. So, uh, if I understand it correctly, you're asking, do you think that 
the uh, U.S. will have a federal data protection law. The, that's where I think the political economy of this kind of federal privacy legislation has to be understood. So who are the stakeholders who are affected and what is their bargaining power? <laughs> that is what is going to ultimately determine whether we have a federal privacy law or not. The problem is the people who benefit from not having a federal privacy law are large companies with a lot of resources and they are very concentrated and they coordinate very well. They coordinate very well. On the other side, you have ordinary consumers who, who, who are uncoordinated, uh, who in our individual loss may not be so high. Each of our losses are, 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 are not that high. So we are an uncoordinated bunch. So you can see the political economy uh, of this situation is that some stakeholders are very powerful and well coordinated and and the benefits are accrued by these small number of entities and the costs are borne by millions and millions of Americans, each of whom is individually not affected that much. So, so, so what we really need is more coordination amongst consumers and citizens. So if as long as there is more coordination amongst average Americans, then I think there will be a federal law. And the fact that the GDPR has been passed and really it's fairly successful. Now, of course, people are, are criticizing the GDPR also and saying there's not enough fines, uh, that there's not enough uh, uh, you know, violations and prosecutions. You know, there's been one prosecution against a Canadian company, and then there was this French uh, case against Google I mentioned. So there's not been that many. So there's people who also argue the GDPR is, is, is also not that strong. But nevertheless, the fact that the GDPR exists and the fact that companies are able to have something like a equivalent of a federal law because the GDPR is EU wide uh, and the EU is you know basically as big as the US so but, so you know so the fact that that exists I think provides more support that maybe there will be a federal law in the future and uh, and I think the more average citizens the more they are uh, upset you know the more you know, we're likely to see a new law. Um, certainly these things are more likely, uh, generally speaking, uh, you, you know, if there is a democratic administration. Uh, so, so you're right to point out uh, the importance of the election and so on and how that will affect uh, privacy law. We have another question of Alexandre. Alexandre, please. Thank you very much for the selection of presentation. My question is about TikTok and the competition law. Uh, what What's your opinion in, in the access to the personal data from the population as an element uh, of uh, competition law. Uh, I think. Uh, what What are your What are the connections between uh, these issues under U U U.S. law? So um, uh, this is this is a huge, huge issue, issue. Uh, and uh, the basic argument is that. Having access to your data allows these companies to engage in a lot of anti-competitive practices because the data that they collect 
is not being shared. So they can use the data. So people like Amazon, etc., use the data in ways that create barriers to entry for other people to come in. And they have so much data over such a long period of time that their ability to restrain competition is only getting worse. <laughs> it's only getting, it cannot get better. So, so that's, that's the competition law argument. The problem is if you force everyone to share all this information, if that's the solution to this problem, then now you have even less privacy. You know, so part of the problem is everybody recognizes there is a problem. But the question is, what is the remedy? How, what is the remedy that makes sense? Should it be like a public utility where all this data is shared with by everybody? Is that the answer? Okay. Maybe, but then you're, you know, then you've really made it almost impossible to have privacy. <laughs> because now everybody has your data. So I think that's, that's um, you know, part of the problem. People recognize that this massive aggregation of data about you can be anti-competitive. And that is what is driving a lot of criticism uh, of people, especially on the Democratic side. So, and, and of course, even on the Republican side, uh, you have it. some people who are talking about busting up, uh, you know, Amazon and so on, uh, you know, for, for, for this reason. Now, the TikTok issue is a slightly different issue because that raises a different issue. What you're seeing in Chinese companies is essentially two approaches. One approach is like TikTok. Meaning ByteDance, the Chinese parent company, is a Chinese company, and they want to have a U.S. company that is completely separate. So that's one business model. Have a U.S. company and make it truly separate. You know, uh, and, and, and that's one approach. The other approach is the Huawei approach. The Huawei approach is, no, we are a Chinese company, and uh, we have international subsidiaries, uh, but, but we are going to be the Chinese parent. Uh, and, and so the question is, is the Huawei approach or the TikTok approach, which approach is, or, or the bike dance approach and the Huawei approach, which is better? I think that remains to be seen. <laughs> but, but, you know, Huawei is running into so much trouble with their business model that TikTok is trying to do something different. They're, they're trying something totally different. They're saying this U.S. company is entirely there, you know? So, so I think it's, that it raises some interesting questions as to how this is going to play out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. I don't know if uh, there is another question. Yes, yes, I'd like, like to do it. Make a Please, Yes, yes. Professor Jake Kizan, uh, good, good morning. Um, you've, good morning. you've talked about many important issues uh, uh, this morning uh, uh, in, uh, in reference to Federal Trade Commission and the uh, and the institutions that regulate the American system. Uh, I'm very interested about uh, what could be the uh, big uh, important changes for the institution, especially uh, concerning data protection and the federal regulate um, the federal uh, authority that is responsible for the data is the Federal Trade Commission. And how could uh, in the of course you talked about statues and so on, but what what could be a, a good direction of changes to represent? Of course there is. Uh, Political econ uh, economy issue. That's the, that's the, the issue actually. But also the play, the role that the judiciary and the courts make 
in um, uh, putting that into effect and wh what kind of, of direction of regulations we could uh, learn and, and uh, slowly maybe change. Uh, if you can comment on that, please. Thanks. Um, um, your question is a great one. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about, for example, tort liability for privacy violations, because that is where the courts are coming in, where the courts are acting like private attorney generals. And the courts are saying, hey, if these people's data has been collected and not properly protected, you have not done what you should have reasonably done. So, 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 you know, so that is another way of forcing companies to, even if they collect your data, at least they have to protect it. Now, it doesn't solve the other gentleman's question, which is they're collecting all this data and engaging in anti-competitive conduct. <laughs> so, so, so it doesn't solve that problem, but it at least addresses the issue of keeping your data private. Now, there are other people who argue the FTC is not the right agency, and we need a new privacy czar. We need a new privacy agency. We need a new privacy czar. So there are other people who think that way, that, that their focus should really be on privacy. And you need a agency, you need a commission that really will focus on this. So. So, you know, because the FTC is really not doing enough. And the jurisdiction of the FTC focusing on deceptive consumer practices is narrow and you really need a broader mandate. So, yes, you're right. Uh, so the one solution is to have a, a new agency with more powers. Another is, of course, to actually allow some of these lawsuits to go forward because the problem is that courts have not recognized data insecurity is actually a social harm and our autonomy is compromised our privacy is compromised is not really seen as being a harm that is actionable under tort law because you know it's like the data is still there Nothing has happened to your data. Now 10,000 more people have it. So what's the problem? This is nothing, you know, this is not really a harm, you know? <laughs> so, so this is part of the problem. Thank you, Professor. One more question. I think uh, we... Yeah, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hello. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir. Uh, uh, I have a question regarding this legislation issue in the in the U.S. Uh, you said that there's a lobby situation that uh, that prevents uh, U.S. from having a federal. Uh, uh, I'm just explaining the political economy. Yes. Uh, yes, but you see, California, for us in Brazil. It's a, a place where all companies, tech companies are are placed and they were able to to have a legislation regarding data protection. So uh, wasn't there a problem in in, uh, in California? What what are the differences between California and the rest of the US? So great question. So why did the CCPA pass in California? Simple. In California, the state legislature is really not multiple parties. Uh, the House, the Senate, the governor, they're all from the same party. <laughs> so, so, so that's, uh, that's, the, that's first. Uh, so, so these are strongly democratic state. Uh, and so, so, so they were able to pass it. The, People who look at the CCPA, though, point out that it's an example of legislation, but it really is not. There's big differences between the GDPR and the CCPA on the substance. 
<laughs> so, so yes, you pass something. Yes, you can opt out, but you know, okay, I give you the right to opt out, but so what? You can't, you know, if you opt out, you cannot read anymore. You cannot browse anymore. You cannot, <laughs> you know, so, so yes, it's true that you do, you can delete your data. That is true. So, 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 so that is true. Uh, and you can check what data they have. And so if they have some incorrect information uh, about you, uh, uh, you know, then, you know, you can um, change it. Hey, this is, uh, I am this other Julia. I'm not this Julia. Uh, I'm so, 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 so the information you have about me is wrong. Uh, you know, I don't have a credit card problem. I don't have a debt problem. Fix it. <laughs> so, 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 so that is good. So keep in mind uh, that this helps these companies too. It helps them uh, to have good, correct information about you. Uh, so, 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 so you see, the, the, the point here is the law that was passed was limited, but also it was passed in a way that was quite helpful to these people. So, uh, so, so I think it's, it's too simple to say California passed it and, and somebody else, how come? Uh, I think yes, but you really should look at the law and look at uh, the, also the polit political economy of California, of course. Uh, but, um, but in some ways, the law is actually helping to ensure that uh, you know, good, correct data is being collected about you. you know, does that make sense? Thank you. More questions? No? I think uh, we reach our time. So I would like uh, oh, yeah, yeah. One, one more. Yeah. Uh, I, have, uh, I have one last question regarding okay. the federal legislation. And th first of all, thank you for your presentation, uh, Professor. And if, if it's possible and if we still have time, I would like you to comment about the the recent decision of the European Court of Justice about the privacy shield. And if you think that this decision could make the American companies support uh, a federal legislation in order to guarantee uh, the, the transference of data from the Europe to America. Yeah, well, well you, you, we're definitely the, the US privacy shield is something the government was really pushing uh, because the companies are pushing. So that's why I mentioned there are these two frameworks, mm -hmm. the US EU framework and the Swiss <clears throat> US framework. So I do think um, this USC privacy shield is important. Um, now, will that result in the new laws being passed, which is your question? I think it cuts both ways. It cuts both ways because it allows these companies to say, look, there is now a privacy shield. Everything is fine. Uh, you, you know, everything is good. We don't need a federal law. <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, you, we are we are fully complying with GDPR. Uh, you know, so so there's no problem. Uh, so you know, so so I think it sort of it cuts both ways. On the other hand, you are right. It does allow people who want legislation to say, hey. The GDPR did not cause so much chaos. And, you know, there's good mechanisms in place. So let's at least have one federal law for privacy. The concern that the companies have is once there is a big federal law protecting privacy, then that is the camel's nose in the tent. And over time, <laughs> this law might become stronger, bigger. So, so, so you see, that's why the privacy shield actually, you could argue, makes it harder to have a federal. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think there is another colleague that would like to question. No? So I would like to to again uh, to to thank you, Professor Kizen, 
Uh, for us, it's a great honor to receive you here with us in our uh, webinar. Uh, we expect to receive you again in other opportunities. And uh, I expect to return to Illinois, to Urbana-Champaign, to be with you uh, in a summer time, because in the winter it's too hard to, for a Brazilian guy. <laughs> but uh, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you would like to to uh, say something, yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, for yeah, us yeah. it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you I've, know been I've been to, to many parts of Brazil actually, uh, and but I have not been to uh, you know Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, so, uh, but, but but I have been to uh, Sao Paulo and I have been to uh, Rio and. Uh, I have been to Brazilia and have been to Parisicaba and, and a whole bunch of other places. So, uh, so a lovely country, country and so, and so uh, it's, it's a, it's nice, a nice, 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 nice way to engage. Uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. The, the, the next time, I, I would like to invite you to be here with us Happy in a presidential web, uh, seminar. <laughs> Uh, indeed, happy to do it. Happy to do it. Um, it really was a very nice discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, people. And bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care.